hopefully this is working properly, uh, we'll start straight off um, so that we can keep to time. Uh, welcome to the first lots of streamed <laughs> sessions for NDF 2017. Um, my name's Michael Perry, I'm chairing this session. Um, today, this afternoon, we have uh, two, two presentations. First, first up, we have a, a longer um, panel discussion on AV and virtual, reali virtual reality. Um, which will be going over um, about 50 minutes, so it's a, a bit of an extra long one, followed by um, a session from Greg Rolston on digital transformation, I believe it was, um, if he turns up. So to, this is a panel discussion um, on AV <coughs> and VR. Um, the panel members are, we have um, Kaylin Huntress from uh, Stellar Platforms on the end here, um, in the middle we have Niles Pokel from the um, Auckland War Memorial Museum who is, I see from Twitter this morning, moving to Nelson. Yep. So going to Nelson, going from Auckland War Museum to Nelson, so that's going to be a change in climates for you. Yep. And, uh, and Christopher Petrie from, the, from UIT. So um, I'm going to pass it over to um, these gentlemen to uh, introduce themselves and talk a little bit about um, what brought them to AV and um, VR and what interests them. Um, when they finish that, we've got some discussion, pro uh, some questions and things to discuss, and then we'll open up to the floor to, for questions. So I'll start off by passing it to Chris. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, so I come to AR and VR from um, a variety of perspectives. Um, first and foremost, I've got a startup called Insight VR and we are building uh, high-risk uh, training scenarios for, for high-risk environments, say like uh, for firefighters or for uh, industry training, basically. So I think VR in particular offers that, that affordability to be able to experience really high-risk situations without the risk of being, being uh, seriously hurt. Um, the second part that I'm I'm really interested in, in particular, that kind of encompasses everything is teaching and learning. So uh, I'm also a teacher and I've uh, been in classrooms where uh, we're building VR and AR environments using the Unity platform, which some of you probably know. Um, and th yeah, so those are the two main, main areas that I am interested in, in VR and AR. So, I think that's probably me. <laughs> Kia ora koutou, um, my name is Niels, thank you for the introduction. Um, so, I'm in the Digital Experience Manager at the Auckland Museum. Um, still am the Digital Experience Manager at the Auckland Museum. And we have had a various attempts in AR and VR in the past. Um, a bit of dabbling in, in mixed reality as well, using HoloLens, which was initially going to be um, my talk today, but then was collated in this panel. Um, and we've learned quite a few things on the way of, of you know, the kind of stuff that works, the kind of stuff that doesn't really work that well in, in, a, in a high traffic environment with visitors trying to, to hammer the hardware as hard as they can. And um, we're at a point, I'm at a point where I'm starting to wonder, okay, so how, wh what does that actually mean when we think about how we're going about planning the future museum experiences. If we're thinking about permanent galleries, what, what's the implication of mainstream augmented reality, mainstream VR, what, what are the sort of expectations from the visitors and how do, we, how do we need to plan for that? How does that actually spatially manifest if we want to create VR bubbles in a gallery space? Or do we worry about object labels because everyone's going to have MR overlays in their, in their wearable lenses in five years? You know. What does it actually mean? And um, I'm really looking forward to, to discussing that with the likes of yourselves and the panel to see um, if there are maybe some, some inklings of an answer to that question, who knows? And um, maybe also get a better understanding of, of you know, whether that need is maybe just a fad all up. You know, maybe we shouldn't be bothering in the first place. Maybe we should just stick to our guns and um, we're better off that way. So, yeah, looking forward to a really good discussion. Thank you. 
Hello, my name is Kaylin Huntress, and uh, I'm the creative director of Stellar Platforms, which is a uh, digital marketing company. And um, I, uh, I help people sell stuff online and help identify product market fit between uh, products and consumers. And uh, I was involved with a couple of prototype uh, VR applications uh, that were uh, uh, in order to discover where do we find this fit. And Steve Raymond, who's the, the CEO of a, of a New Zealand-based VR company, I think ADI, uh, he said, uh, uh, VR hasn't found product market fit yet. And I find this to be one of the most interesting problems with VR, because the technology is fantastic. The things that we can do with the technology are, are really impressive, but getting it into the hands of users and achieving that mass adoption, it, it, whoever does that is going to, we know that there's going to be a lot of activity. And so the activity that we see in VR right now is people improving the technology and trying to figure out where's that fit. And uh, in one of my earlier attempts to find that fit was documenting the Oregon Trail. And uh, the Oregon Trail ha has a place of nostalgia with uh, people of my generation in America because when public computers or hit the public school system, they all shipped with this one game made by Broderbund called the Oregon Trail. And it taught you the history of these covered wagons that went from the Mississippi River in the center of the North American continent out west. And this was how the western half of America was populated in the mid-1800s. And so I worked with, uh, with a group of people who got some funding from the Oregon Historical Society to document the Oregon Trail with uh, immersive panoramas. And so we would take a 360 panorama, we would get historical actors to enter the frame and talk about what was there, we'd link the panoramas together, and, uh, and it was really interesting technology, but we couldn't find a fit so that it worked well for the school kids who could be going through an immersive experience on the Oregon Trail, or for the on-site applications, where um, on-site you'd be at a, at a historical location where you know something of significance happened in Oregon <coughs> history, but how do you access it on a tablet when there's no Wi-Fi, and no internet connection, and actually get into that panorama? So we, we spent some time finding out where are the limitations of this technology, and now the technology is continuing to advance. You know, we, we're catching up to that point where somebody's going to find that mix where the technology, the story, and the user all align, and this could get really big, really fast. And so I find this to be a really exciting time because nobody really knows when that is or how it's going to happen. And it's through conversations like this that somebody's going to uncover that idea. Yeah, no, no one's taking notes already. Um, so we've got, a, we've got a, a series of questions that we've sort of pre-gone through that we'll start to move through, but feel free, free, feel free to interject at any time on, and pose questions to the panel. I'm sure that they would um, like that, especially if something comes up that's particular interest or particularly you want to know about. Um, but the first thing is we'll, we'll, go, we'll start off with is if each of you could um, give us a couple of things that you think are unique promises or unique benefits to AR and VR and what potential, I know you've sort of covered a bit of it, and what you might think are the, um, the most obvious negatives or most obvious disadvantages. So we'll start off in that way. Uh, do we, just to kind of get a sense of, of the room, do we need to provide any definitions of, of what that stuff is in the first place? Do we all know what AR, VR, MR stands for or, yeah? Cool. Okay. Good. <laughs> cool. So, um, yeah. So, I'm I'm very much a believer that this is the the new the new platform that's going to inevitably, eventually, we don't know when, is going to take over our rectangular screens of 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 um, that limited sphere. So. Um, a, I think a good way of putting it, as someone um, mentioned to me the, uh, the other week, was it's kind of like you're stepping into computational space. And the cool thing about programming and the digital environment is there are no rules, there are no kind of limitations on uh, physics and um, even if a square is, is the same dimensions as what it could be in, in real life. So. I think 
in terms of what I've seen, we're only just starting to scratch the, the very, very tip of that surface um, in terms of what what's, could be a potential. Um, and within that, I think one of the biggest gaps in terms of uh, VR and AR at the moment is the level of interaction. So um, most of the experiences that I've seen have been just observational and they're quite short and they, it tends to be a little bit gimmicky. So I, one, of the, one of the questions I'm um, constantly asking as, a, as an educator is what is the, the real um, teaching and learning uh, value in this? What is the pedagogical uh, impact of this beyond just presence or beyond just being able to experience this, um, like be able to go to ancient, <coughs> ancient Rome or whatever. Um, so for me, that's when you start to interact uh, with the environment. You can push objects around, you can uh, see what happens when you try something. And going deeper into that, there's this idea of embodied cognition, which I'm just really, really super <coughs> excited about once we, once we start to break that barrier with the likes of uh, Motion Leap, which um, some of you have, may have seen where you can actually track your hand movements and then interact with different objects and bounce them around and that kind of thing. Um, so I think that's, that's where it's super interesting, interesting from the perspective of an educator because then you can start to track your movements and you can start looking at the kinds of um, experiences that are highly valued in a, in a teaching and learning environment rather than just this kind of observational experience of going, oh, well, you know, you don't really feel like you've been to ancient Rome or gone to see the, um, the Eiffel Tower or whatever. Um, you know, that's just, to me, that's kind of a surface level and we're, we're only just kind of just going on those edges. But once we start to uncover those layers and start to dig a little bit deeper, particularly in terms of interacting with the environment and to start measuring those, those interactions, um, I think that's when things are going to get really, really industry interesting. And for me, I think where that's going to happen, where that innovation is going to happen, is going to be in universities and schools um, for educational purposes, and also uh, industry industry training. So that obviously has really huge um, implications for for the glam sector as well. So I think that's probably enough for me. <laughs> I mean, I think I would add museums to that, naturally. Um, because, I mean, one of the things that, that most excites me about it is, is this the ability to provide additional layering and, and contextualization of, of objects, you know, and actually a really unique form to provide, you know, uh, s storytelling mechanisms that are object-centric with augmented reality. So, so I, I could have an object and I can at attach pointers to it that talk to specific features of the object, or I could overlay you know, the, the, f the flesh and bones, uh, the flesh on top of the bones of the dinosaurs to, s to show what they looked like when, or might have looked like when they, when they were still roaming the earth. That, that sort of um, idea of, of um, bringing objects to life in a digital way that's, that's not textural but is really taking into account the physicalities of the object is really interesting. So. Um, from my perspective, I'm probably more interested in in, uh, in the augmented and mixed reality side of it rather than the, the VR side of it. We've, we've done a quite a few experiments with VR, and I think it is a very, very powerful storytelling tool. But I'm um, thinking of public environments. In most cases, you know, theme, theme parks aside, maybe it didn't really seem to, to do the right things for us yet. Um, but I'm very excited about the ability of, of, of creating a richer visitor experience using, using that sort of tech. Once you kind of, and that to me is one of those risks, once you, you get over that fact that you, you're introducing technology layer, that you, you force people to look through stuff through their screens, and you're actually severing them from, from the physical special experience that they come to in the museum, um, you know, you're actually introducing an artificial element that, that might be detrimental to the experience. Um, which kind of goes hand in hand with the fact that we're also introducing a digital divide for those people who don't 
who don't have the abilities to interact with that stuff or who don't have the means, don't have the devices to do it. So that's something that we also, that I've learned that we have to be very mindful of because if, you, if you're setting that expectation, it's this amazing content and you're going to have the greatest time of your life if you manage to get in and if you have the, if, you know, if you have the skills and the gear to do it. And um, we've learned painfully that, that if, if you create that, that proposition, and then visitors can't do it for whatever reason, they're really, really frustrated and, and, and pissed off, and it's a really bad experience for them. So um, it's, a, it's a balancing act, really. Um, and then this idea of uh, once this is ubiquitous, and we have it all, you, no, I always get that wrong, ubiquitous, ubiquitous, sorry, second language. <laughs> um, so you, you know, you'd have the wall plastered with AR content, and wherever we go, there's a AR billboards <coughs> that respond to our, um, you know, personalized preferences and so on. Do we, you know, will we be just adding to the noise or not? Um, yeah. So that, f to me, is one of those one of the risks that are inherent with that. that if it becomes this big thing that is just <coughs> everywhere, how long will it take for people to to just zone out and, and isn't this just like like ads that you don't see when you when you're browsing online um yeah so one of the biggest limitations i see to vr to build on what nils was saying is that the the piece of hardware that you're using to interact with the virtual reality becomes the fourth wall and the fourth wall is a theatrical term where if the three of us are sitting up here and we're doing a stage play and we're talking to each other and ignoring you, there are three walls around us and this invisible fourth wall that the audience agrees and the performers agree is, is there so that we can have our performance and have this whole world and you're watching the world through this fourth wall. With virtual reality, the hardware that you're using becomes that fourth wall. And the effectiveness of a performance based is usually based on how well that fourth wall is erected and maintained throughout the length of the performance. Well, right now we're in the early stages of VR technology. When you think a century down the line how this is going to evolve, they're going to look at this big headgear and think that we were so dumb in these big <laughs> goggles, right? Uh, and the goggles are, they're fantastic with what they can do for us now, but they only handle sight. And so we have one sense that's completely immersive. You can introduce sound as well, but how well the user gets immersed into the experience is limited by how well they can integrate with the hardware and forget that they're not in the physical world. And so that fourth wall question is becoming something that only hardware can really answer. Um, I understand the, the, uh, when you were speaking earlier on about finding, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, what you said earlier on about the uh, uh, the technology not quite coming of age yet, not yet finding its market niche, uh, resonated with me, um, and I truly believe that that will happen before too long. Uh, but the main market, the main uh, driver of most market growth in tech, is uptake in the United States, and uh, and that's where the crash is. Let's let's call it for most new technology. Um, how are the impending uh, this impending rush towards uh, the abandonment of net neutrality and the potential for uh, uh, for internet speeds to be actually quite seriously choked off for that entire emerging market uh, going to affect this outbreak? Uh, does it have the potential to sort of uh, smother the baby in its crib? Because I imagine this technology is, is going to succeed largely based on uh, on decent interconnectivity speeds, decent interactivity with a server miles and miles and miles away. Um, when those speeds are choked off and that, and that, uh, uh, that service starts to stutter and, and uh, buffer and uh, become uh, not in any way seamless, is that going to sort of smother the baby in the crib? Or are we going to be looking back in 20 years and, and thinking what might have been with alternate reality? And and VR. Well, let's, let's assume your proposition that the net is throttled and that we don't have ubiquitous internet connection speeds for everybody. Then VR would be limited to the hardware that's already downloaded the application. 
It's not something that you, any of us would be able to load independently on our devices. It would be something that in a VR headset that had already downloaded everything, then you could use it there, but we would lose the ability to load it on our own devices. Yeah, I think so. The, it, it's, it's important to differentiate between those things that are networked, I guess, social experiences, which are in a very different nature than, than those ones, you know, similar to, to gaming, where you, where you have your own kind of sandbox that, that's just localized. It, that's kind of where I see the big expansion, the big mushrooming yeah. happening. You know, I, I can't imagine it would affect uh, your interactive uh, experience at the museum, which is run on a local server and probably being over the local Wi-Fi. Oh, sorry. Uh, probably uh, distributed over the local Wi-Fi. Um, uh, what I see it inhibiting is uh, online gaming, uh, people using uh, using it in a social media uh, uh, format and uh, with slower internet speeds and choked off internet speeds, um, that that's where I see the, the baby sort of uh, having a failure to thrive, if you like. Yeah, could be. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, it feels like, yeah, of course, if, if internet connectivity becomes an issue, that will that will stifle it. But I don't. I'm not sure if that's if if I would see that to be the biggest risk. You know, what do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> Just passing on the door here, because uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's a definitely a, um, yeah, net neutrality is a is a worry, but there's there's massive market drive to get this technology uh, working. You know. Facebook own Oculus. Um, you know, I don't know how much Magic Leap is worth now, but you know, you see them in the news. It's just ridiculous. Like how much money has been poured into this stuff, and so there's um, there's hu a huge drive to get this to enable this technology. Um, yeah, how how that gets affected by net neutrality, I'm not too too sure, but I'm pretty sure that um, companies want to make a lot of money out of it. So if it becomes possible, it will, yeah, I don't think they'll, yeah, they'll open up floodgates as opposed to shutting down, I think, personally. Uh, there's a question. Oh. We're talking about uh, internet connectivity and all that, and the amount of money organisations will want to try and make out of this. How much is this going to limit this technology just to the Western world? where all your developing countries are still struggling with some ridiculous prices like $50 a megabit for bandwidth um, in Africa. Um, how's, do they get left behind in all this? Um, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. Um, yeah, developing nations, I think, would be a, a huge factor in that respect in terms of limiting the, the technology. Do you guys yeah, have any the thoughts? Issue, then, is delivery, isn't it? Whether it's internet or whatever, delivery is the issue. Yeah. It's really hard to deliver these experiences. Yeah, well, I think part of <laughs> well, the, probably the biggest issue is that, you know, people just don't have, well, particularly the headsets, if we're talking about headsets. Um, but yeah, uh, and I think, you know, even the, the smartphone and the, the iPad kind of augmented reality, um, style thing is still still relatively new. I think people are still trying to figure it out um, in terms of what works and what doesn't work. Do you guys have any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, thinking about the possibility of a throttled internet or looking at the reality of lower connection speeds in developing countries, um, the market could discover uh, unexpected advantages to solve these problems. And one of the the example that's coming to my mind is Minecraft. Minecraft can create an immense, immersive world because of the simplicity of its graphics. So a lot of times when we talk about AR requiring such high bandwidth to load anything, it's because we're assuming that there's these extremely high resolution photos that we are capable of taking. And that we use the highest resolution possible in order to create this immersive experience. We may find that five years down the road, a low bit solution for an immersive virtual reality might be the more ubiquitous solution that more people can take advantage of. Okay, so I, I do have a question, um, but 
Before I ask, I'm, I'm just conscious that we've been hearing, and that's not necessarily a problem, but we've been hearing from a bunch of blokes, and I'm another bloke. Is there someone who's not a bloke who'd like to <laughs> contribute to the conversation at that point? Because I'd rather that happen than I ask my question. No. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, picking up from the the first round of conversation, um, there's there's concern in the media about fake news, and we might have a parallel, perhaps deeper concern about fake views, uh, the possibilities of AR and VR might make us think about how when something's in a, in a gallery or a museum, it's a mediated experience. And Ryan, you were talking about the, the potential for totally new physics of interaction. And if you've got totally new physics and it's a, it's a designed mediated experience, what's the responsibility to ensure you're not delivering damaging kinds of fake views? Huge responsibility, I think. I mean, um, I guess as museums, that's that's something that we're struggling, what, we're challenged with in, in all the mahi that we that we do, right? It, it's 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 if you break it down to to the the mere fact that it's just another way of, of storytelling, mind you, albeit a, a way of more intense personalized storytelling or or um, empathic storytelling, if you like, it still comes down to to us taking the responsibility to be as, as objective and and um, um, considered as possible, you know. Um, so I, I wouldn't tie that back to the actual medium itself. I mean, uh, as, as a museum, speaking as a museum, I would think that is our responsibility anyway. It's, it's not necessarily related to a medium. Just um, push on that. I, I think there, are, there might be some possibilities in the medium. So for example, how could you represent uncertainty in a, in a VR or AR environment? Because we don't, we don't have all the facts. Yeah. Sometimes that's quite apparent from the way a museum will present an exhibit. Yeah. Is, is there room for innovation to represent uncertainty about what the full story is in new ways? I'd say yes. But it's it's uncharted territory. But I think I think so. Yes, that there, there, there should be. I mean, it doesn't all you know. It doesn't need to be hyper real. You know, there there, there needs to be room for ambiguity and and um, and that sort of grey area. So I think that's a very inter interesting thought um, as to how you would how you would facilitate that. So I wouldn't have an answer to that. But I think um, there there needs to be that sort of that sort of discussion around how we actually do that. Yeah, nice thought. Sure. Just, um, I, I don't know, I got, I got um, yeah, related, to, I think partly related to that idea is uh, we don't know what the long-term effects of, of using this technology are. Um, health and safety is kind of a huge question mark uh, I mean, everyone's probably heard that you get motion sickness from some of the, the older experiences. Having the screen this close to your face for long periods of time, I'm not too sure about that. Um, and, yeah, picking up on the diverse diversity and gender um, issue is, is a huge, huge um, issue, I think, especially when you are starting to get people to socially interact in these worlds. Um, and they're actually, you know, playing like a second life kind of type game. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's one of those longer, you know, you imagine probably perhaps not now, but uh, 15 to 20 years time when all of this technology is being made and developed by essentially um, a lot of what will be uh, white males, you know, to what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of voices are getting missed out of in that in that spectrum? So um, that is a huge concern um, with this, with a lot of the just dis disruptive technologies. I think. Actually, have I had a question on that one um, for the panel in this? Um, the broad broadening that out into a more um, ethics and um, ethics in AR and VR. Um, when Google first came out 
with its Google Glass, its version where you go wandering around with glasses, there was a bit of a backlash against the porn stability for about invasion of privacy. Um, you never know whether someone's recording you when they're just looking at you with your glasses. Now, with the way that the technology is improving and getting smaller, soon we won't be able to tell, even from a visual clue, whether somebody's wearing a, a VR or AR set on their faces. And I'm sure that's going to bring lots of things where you can wander. It's going to lead to that vision where you walk down the street and ads pop out in front of your, in front of your glasses that no one else can see. But there is ethical and, you know, ethical and philosophical questions around that, around invasions of privacies, about what what people can overlay on other people and what rights people have. Do you guys have any thoughts about that broader um, philosophical and ethical use of AR and AR technologies? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, um, probably some of people have watched Black Mirror and I think it's, uh, I can't remember what episode it is, but there's an episode where uh, there's a woman who um, rates all her social interactions and you have to get up to a certain rating and it's, it's just ridiculous. Um, but I think that really articulates some of the ethical issues. I can't remember what, does anyone know what episode it is? Third series. Third series. I think it's maybe the first or second one, but yeah, I'll just, um, it's a great kind of dystopian uh, viewpoint of that idea. Sorry, I was just... <laughs> Yeah, I think there is a responsibility in, in, in the types of content that we create and that's something that we can already control now in those experiences that we do put on the floor in our example, you know, in our instance. So if we create a VR experience or an AR experience, we need to be mindful that it's not too jarring. Say if I have a, have a VR headset in the galleries and um, I, I expect visitors to put that on, I need to make sure that I transition them into the experience and I just kind of pluck them out and drop them out of out of space and th and then they'll have you know that they, they, they they're disoriented they don't know where they where they are they get some sickness and they they don't feel like it's a good experience so so there's there, there's definitely things that already we can we can do that that help create pleasant respectful experiences and that sort of you know, can translate into into kind of a code of code of AR ethics or whatever. If if, if that's kind of what we're what we're getting to at some point, um, that speaks to how we actually en uh, engage with with AR augmented people. You know, with augmented people, how do we? You know, th there's there's definitely a set of rules that we'll that we'll be de developing. I guess as to how that engagement needs to work to be pleasant, you know, and, and not jarring and, and um, off-putting. So I have a prediction that because we don't know what these ethical rules are, in order for us to define what they are, we're going to discover what they are when they're broken. <laughs> There are going to be people that break these unwritten rules that some of us will be thinking as we develop these kinds of uh, experiences, well, we really shouldn't be too pushy here. There's going to be somebody who doesn't even think that way and is going to go too far, and that will give us the story for us to define where the boundary is. And until somebody can verbalize where that boundary is, there's going to be somebody who pushes too far because they don't know that the boundary is there. None of us know. Uh, I, I follow, a, I'm a digital marketer, and so I follow a lot of sales people and sales trainers and people selling stuff online. And they, they have two considerations, is what's effective, and what's going to make somebody upset. And if something doesn't make anybody upset and it's effective, great. But if you don't know if it makes somebody upset, but you know it's effective, you still push as hard as you can until you get that pushback. And so I think what we're going to see is a couple of really clear examples of somebody who has gone too far. That story is going to get shared around on social media. And all of us as civilians outside of the problem are going to look at that and say, well, yeah, that's not right because this and this and this. And then all of a sudden we'll develop that cultural lexicon for what is appropriate and what isn't appropriate. But we won't know until somebody breaks those unwritten rules. My money's on the corner. <laughs> Um, just hey guys, um, just going on that what you said right now. So we're basically going to be blundering into these things to discover them. 
Um, is there any danger of that actually killing the VR industry? I mean, you know, if we go too far, for example. I can't think of an instance where it would deflate the excitement and funding that's already pushing this movement forward. So I'd, I'd, I'd posit no as my answer. What, what, what would you think? If, sure, um, if, uh, if immersive virtual reality experiences caused widespread seizures in people and there was an unexpected medical component that would put the user at risk, I could see that deflating. Yeah. And, um, sorry, just uh, one last question before I get going. Um, just going by how fast technology has been evolving these past few years, do you think we'll ever reach that ideal level of VR? Because right now, locomotion is just, I'm talking about like open world games, so you can't move around, so you'd have to teleport. So do you think we'll ever get to that point where we just jack into something and that's it? We're in VR world? I feel that the hardware is really the answer to that. That as long as there's a piece of hardware between us, that we have to continually pretend that we're in this world. But once we can jack in to the point where we don't, we are the hardware, then I think it will be completely immersive. Do you think that'll actually happen then? Moore's Law, anybody want to make a calculation? Yeah. We've seen people totally buy it, like they're totally in They're shocked when they take it off. Yeah, I think it's too early to tell with any kind of degree of um, accuracy with with a question like that. But um, particularly because there's a lot of promises that AI will solve all our problems in terms of um, creating all these environments, so we don't have to create every little blade of grass ourselves and all that kind of thing. Um, and there's a lot of technologies which, you know, say, for instance, like um, shoot laser beams or whatever into your into your retina, so you don't have to wear goggles. And you know, there's there's all sort and haptic suits which make you feel like a, a you know um, the impact of um, crashing into something, all that kind of thing. I don't think it'll. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's too early to tell, but I'm highly skeptical of the idea that you'll get to the point where it's just seamless. Um, it's perhaps more of a biomedical question, which I don't have no expertise in. <laughs> well, maybe it's more, more a matter of reaching kind of a dream state, you know, where, where you're, you're in a stasis sort of, and you experience it as being a real, you know, a real experience, even though you're just, you know, that's your matrix version, basically. You're, you're suspended in a, in a solution, in a salt floating tank or something and you're in you, you're just you are having an experience as if it was the reality but it actually isn't and it and it kind of just does away with the physicalities of it and and overcoming those physical challenges of, of interacting it's just it's the simulation is real enough for you to be, for your brain to be perceived as 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 real so i think that's probably also a you know not a very um nice scenario but definitely a possible one Just uh, going back to the the uh, the concept of of um, ethics and 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 things like that, um, I think there is there is a, a huge barrier with with VR and AR because it does cover your eyes, and so much of uh, evolution, the way that we interpret one another, is through the subtle um, exp you know the subtle interactions between our eyes, and I think the mainstream adoption there's a huge barrier to get through with in regards to that so into yeah um i think people have a long way to go in terms of their acceptance of that idea of covering your eyes and and for it to be socially acceptable um you imagine someone wearing a mask and you know taking the bus to work or something like that it'd be pretty pretty weird um yeah so i think it's different like uh, i think forbes predicted that uh, VR and AR would be something like a $125 billion market by the year 2025. And I think that was based on smartphone adoption. Um, so I, 
I just don't really see that happening because of some of these barriers and a lot of different limitations that it, that, um, it has. But yeah. I'm aware that we've sort of gone onto a very dystopian sort of, <laughs> gone to the negative AV and a VR, so maybe we should try and turn it back to some of the more positive, since I think we're, um, many of us are keen on AR and VR. So um, could you each give us um, an example of where you see AR, VR being done right now, which is a really good example of something that's, that's done well and done right? I might just think about that one for a sec. Do you guys know? Again, speaking from a, from a museum um, perspective and speaking about augmented reality, I think that um, one of the, the things that I've seen that I really like is the, the flesh and bones um, app that the um, American Museum of Natural History have released where uh, visitors can look at a display um, case with dinosaur bones in it and they point their iPad at it and um, it shows what the, the animal looked like. And it's, it's as simple as that, it's not much to it, and they can flick away from the layers and see what it looks like under the skin, what the muscle system looked like, what the nervous system looked like, how it, how it all, you know, how the blood's pulsing through it. And there's, there's various sort of iterations of that idea that, it, that have been floating around that I, that I really like. There's the, um, the one that's um, been funded by the Google Cultural Institute. I don't know if you've seen that, the... Um, the Gira giraffe Titan doesn't ring a bell. Okay, so um, it, it's a German museum, and they have this big dinosaur hall, um, and it's a similar sort of deal. You you look at the you slip on a VR headset, and um, you are in that dinosaur hall as you see it. That's what I mean by providing a transition um, from the physical space into the VR experience. So you slip on the thing, and you're in exactly the same space minus the people who are with you in the space, because obviously you can't uh, model those, and you're looking at the dinosaur. And then the dinosaur you know, grows flesh, and then starts to animate, and come down and look at you, and go, oh, and, you know, and, uh, all, and then plants grow around it, and then starts eating the plants. So all of a sudden, you know, this whole thing comes to life. You're just seeing the bones, and all of a sudden you know, you've learned about uh, what it eats, where it lives, how it moved, what it looked like. So there's a lot of learning that you can package up like that without actually disrupting y your, 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 your physical, um, you know, without connect severing you from your, from your physical presence. Um, and I think that's a really beautiful example of, of how that can work in, in a museum context. So the best example I can think of of where augmented reality is doing well is with IKEA. They have an app where you can point your phone at the corner and select a couch. See what it looks like there. And you can scroll and select a different couch. And if you like it, you buy it. And then they send you that couch. Um, hands up those people who have experienced uh, tilt brush and those, those applications. So I feel that is one of the, the huge areas. I, that's the applications that I have the most fun in and the most interesting, particularly when you involve other people. So creative experiences inside VR and AR is where it's at for me. Um, so there's so much potential there with, um, you know, just uh, inventing just the wildest worlds um, of, your, of your imagination. And also the, the, the playful ones. So um, I think Facebook have a few demos of you, you being able to play, you know, just having a bu bunch of objects in a space and be able to play with someone within that space. So, um, like, it has a, like a table tennis uh, racket and, and a ball and you can play table tennis for a little bit and then you can do something else. And, um, there's all kind of sorts of little fun, interesting, creative activities that I think has huge benefits for a huge range of, of applications. So that's, that's what I'm really excited about with VR and AR. I think you've, you've, uh, you've mentioned medical training and, and hazard, yeah. hazardous environment training. I think that's also a really good, good example for, for a really effective use of, of VR. I wonder if there's, there's um, I guess not medical training, but um, 
medical treatment scenarios for VR as well? You know, whether, whether you know, because I know it's been used for, um, um, God, what's the word? Patients with fears, you know? That, that yeah. Can you do anything about that? Yeah. Yes, um, so I know it's been tr uh, it's been an effective treatment for phantom limb syndrome, um, where where um, accident victims experience like a, a limb that they have, um, and some I don't understand it completely, but they some experience that that internal pain. Um, so there's a certain uh, trick to be able to do that, and it's really effectively overcome with VR. Um, so that's that's a really huge application, particularly in psychology. I mean, s simply things like public speaking. speaking um, there's a lot of there's a lot of research, really interesting research, already being um, conducted in that sphere. So that's really exciting in terms of being able to um, have huge implications for that. Do you guys have any? I have a little question, a sort of a question observation. I'm going back to the AR. Um, experience in a gallery exhibition setting. Has anyone seen, we've kind of got hung up on using our phones and our rectangular iPads. Has anyone seen using AR with not a rectangle flat box? Maybe a, mic a microscope or a, a magnifying glass type thing that you can run over the space. Something that's uh, more interactive and um, human-centered and more attractive? Yeah. I haven't personally. I mean, that's something that we've We've been trying a lot to kind of take that device layer out. Um, also, because we know that as soon as visitors realize it's a device, especially kids, are going to try and break it. And they do. <laughs> um, so if they don't realize that it's, it, it is an iPad, but it's just a window, basically, then, um, then they won't break it. And they, have it, they focus more on the actual experience that we're trying to get across. So um, one of the things that we did is we, we've took an iPad and mounted it in a way that, that you couldn't interact with it. You just looked at something under it through the camera of the iPad. And then you would interact with the thing under it. So you, it, was a, it was a tangible kinetic experience. You, could, you, know, you had a little block and that block was augmented. It had a rock on it and the rock would, you know, there would be a, a, a hold fast of, a, of a, an algae growing on it, which you wouldn't see if you were just looking at the block. But you could basically take that stone and turn around the stone and interact with the stone, um, which everybody's uh, immediately intuitively capable of doing. You know, there's, there's no learning curve. You pick up a stone and you look at it. Uh, only that you look at it through the screen. And then, then the stone becomes an augmented thing and, and you learn things of the, the, you know, how, the, how the plant attaches to the stone, what sort of organisms live under it and, and that sort of stuff. Um, so that was one way. I mean, it still had that sort of that screen barrier, that that fourth wall. I really like that um, that you that you put between the visitors. But at least you, you know, we managed to get around the fact that they that they noticed necessarily that that, that there was one, you know, because the the rest was so intuitive and easy for them to interact with. Yeah, but then other than that, I mean, the closest that I've I've come. Is with the Hololens, where where it actually um, realizes or recognizes the spatial makeup of the, the the room that you're in and the furniture that you're in, so you can you can place an, a virtual object on a physical one, and it will interact with it. So if, if I place a ball in that chair and I pull away the chair, the ball falls falls down. Um, and I'm you know it doesn't take long for me to 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 forget about the device that I'm wearing because it's just sitting there in my head. There's no cable, there's, there's no mouse or you know, interfaces. I just interact with, with the, the actual, I interact with reality for a change. And, um, and that changes the digital experience that I'm seeing. Um, but it's also fair to say that, that uh, in my opinion, that's not, you know, it's a first generation device um, and it's, we're still a bit away from it. But not for much longer, you know, give it a couple of years. Have they now? <laughs> yeah? Oh, no, I didn't know that, no. Sheesh. Interesting. Well, the technology was really, was, was compelling, yeah. Um, oh, funny. I didn't know that. Some homework to do, hey? <laughs> it's probably worth mentioning that, um, VR in particular has been around since the 60s yeah. and so it's already been through a couple of VR winters. I'm not sure about AR but I imagine it's kind of 
the same kind of deal where like these these technologies they come in and out and i think um i feel like a lot of the hype in the last since about since the first dk1 of the oculus rift has been a little bit overblown <laughs> um so i think we we you know but there's a there's a kind of a stage there where i think it's be becoming feasible to at least get to that that initial that initial level but might want to have yeah, I think so long as we have rectangular screens as our personal interaction device, that that's going to be one of the primary mediums of, of VR. Uh, but there, are some of the advances in screen technology in, include um, uh, bendable screens. And once we get to the point where screens can bend and we can do things like make them into a sphere so that you could have a helmet, we could get a truly immersive experience. But the technology is on the way there. We just haven't gotten there yet. I think we've got time for one any one more question. Anybody got a last question? Um, no. Well, I think we should probably finish up with maybe getting you guys to give us um, one takeaway, one one thing that you'd really like people to focus on about AV and uh, and VR before we round up. If that's all right. Yeah, on the spot. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> One thing to focus on, um, I might count, I might try and think in the next. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think my advice would be to um, to if you haven't already is is to experience with it and, and see if it if it does things for you. You know, um, depending on on what you want to get out of it, but you know, at the least have a crack at playing Pokemon. You know, <laughs> um, or or creating your own AR experience. It's, it's a very simple thing to do. It's not that there is a big sort of technology learning curve anymore. There's ex existing platforms that you can just use and, and pop a, you know, put a 3D model in and see what it looks like in AR and, and see what it feels like and build, build an experience that allows you to have an opinion, I guess, you know, and just work with it. Because we're all kind of part of ex of, of the journey of, of exploring w where this could take us. And in addition to experiencing the technology and having an opinion about it, my uh, advice would be to be forgiving in your opinions about it. This is in toddler stage, this technology. And so I also encourage you to go out and try things that are in VR and AR, but remember that it's we're trying to figure it out. Nobody's found the magic formula yet. So as you're experiencing it, if you have that user friction where you're dissatisfied with the experience, make a note of it, but don't let it deter you from the technology in the future. It's because we're in that toddler stage that that friction is actually what we need to identify what's going to be overcome in the next generations of this technology. I've got an idea. So um, I think um, there was a, a demo of Tilt Brush just around the corner. So for those people who haven't tried it, I think you should give it a go and like experience what it's like to create like a 3D sculpture in, 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 in space. Um, I've, I find it really, really heaps of fun. I think there's a uh, huge potential for that idea of creativity um, to be enabled. Yeah, that's where I'm at. Yeah, yep. and the to Papa stand in Oceania. Thank you very much. I think you could join me in thanking the panelists for that very interesting panel.